Um, well, I, I wanted to start out um, talking about the Super Bowl because as a pastor, we just, we went through Titus and we sat there and talked about uh, what it means uh, to live a godly life and, and uh, a Christ-centered life and a gospel-filled life. And um, we also talked about how it's the responsibility of, of your church leaders to point out false teachers and kind of rebuke them. And so this is going to be a little bit of a uh, little bit of time before we dive into the message this morning. I want to talk about something that was showed uh, during the Super Bowl. Does anybody remember the commercial he gets us? Raise your hand if you remember it. All right. So this uh, this commercial, this organization he gets us um, has been around for a couple of years and and. Um, for the last couple of years, they've shown commercials during the Super Bowl. And each one of them has gotten what I would say in the pastoral wor- world more controversial. And this one kind of tipped over. And so if you're watching that commercial, um, you might have thought, well, there's nothing wrong with this commercial. They're just wanting us to love people. Uh, but as your pastor, um, I, I want to tell you that that was not the message uh, that um, that was portrayed on Sunday uh, by that commercial. There was a lot in that commercial um, that maybe you might not have picked up on. Maybe maybe you didn't like the commercial. Maybe you've heard a little bit about the controversy around that commercial this week because there's been a lot of talk. And so I just wanted to address it with y'all um, and bring it to the forefront because I feel like that's one of my responsibilities. And so the first, I'm, I'm just going to, if you haven't seen the commercial, you can go watch it. I'm not going to say don't go watch it. Um, I thought about playing it for us, but uh, then I decided I didn't really want to uh, put that online and, and, um, and stuff. So I'm just going to kind of demonstrate it or kind of discuss it. So the commercial starts off with a series of pictures um, where people are washing the feet of obvious sinners. Um, and so, uh, it's just still pictures of people watching or, or washing the feet of obvious sinners, uh, who are in some cases in the midst of sinning. Um, and at the end, it just says, uh, he, Jesus hate, he washed feet, um, and, uh, he gets us. Well, so the message that I think they're trying to portray or were trying to portray or was portrayed was that Jesus didn't hate these people. He instead washed their feet and loved them. And that's what every Christian uh, should do. But the most loving thing that a Christian can do is to tell people the gospel. Um, and there was no gospel presentation in that commercial. In fact, if you go to their website... There's no gospel presentation anywhere on their site um, or any kind of clear direction. Uh, you, I might be okay if they were just trying to get people to the website and then there was a clear pre- presentation of the gospel on the website, but there's none of that. Um, in fact, if you look closely at the video, um, the, the people who were always washing the feet of the sinners were actually privileged or what critical race theory um, would, and, and looking at intersectionality and, and, um, and stuff like that would be considered the privileged people. And so the people who were always washing the feet were the, uh, what they would consider as the people who were oppressing the people they were washing their feet. If you don't know anything about critical race theory, or intersectionality, it's, it's a, uh, a worldview that has come, come into uh, prevalence in the last several years, I would say in the last decade, um, that uh, basically promotes that the more oppressed you are, uh, the more, more, uh, the more of a, much of a victim you are, uh, the more voice you should have. Um, and what does the gospel say? The gospel doesn't say that we're oppressed or we're victims, but rather we're perpetrators, right? And so in the commercial, it's, demonst- or it's, it's demonstrating that these people were oppressed, that, that these privileged people should get down and wash their feet because these 
People were victims. That was the message that was being portrayed. That, that Christians have hated these groups of people, and, and we need now to bow down to them, wash their feet, because we have oppressed and victimized them. But the gospel tells us that we're perpetrators, every single one of us. We're perpetrators against the most holy God, that none of us are victims, but rather we're called to lay down our identity, our livelihood, everything at the feet of Jesus. And so um, this, the message that was being portrayed there, it blurs the lines between love and kindness because people can't see themselves. They must not see themselves as victims because if they, if they see themselves as victims, they'll never see themselves as perpetrators against the most holy God. And so when, when we see commercials like this and when you see commercials like this, it's important to go back to Scripture Go back to Scripture and say, does this match up with what Scripture is saying? Yes, Scripture says to love your neighbor, but the most loving thing we can do is tell them about the gospel. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't serve and love and care for a marginalized population group or a person or or a people group that feel hurt or that are lost. We definitely need to do that. But one of the most loving things that we can do is to tell them about the gospel and not leave that out. I heard somebody say this week, they said, if, if people, if we were to only wash people's feet, they would leave with clean feet, but dirty hearts. And, and that's the point. We can't just wash their feet. We got to tell them about the gospel. Um, the other thing on, um, on this, uh, on this organization, this is just, I'm going to be taking direct quotes from their website and why we, we look at this and say, man, that's, that's, that doesn't align with us as Christians. This is directly from their website about, uh, when, when they're talking about, uh, about us, how can we read it? This is how can we rediscover the life, life and teachings of Jesus, the world's most radical love activist. That is our agenda at He Gets Us, to move beyond the mess of our cult- current cultural, cultural moment to a place where all of us are in- invited to rediscover the love story of Jesus, Christians, non-Christians, and everybody in between, all of us. He Gets Us is a diverse group of Jesus followers with a wide variety of faith journeys and lived experiences. Our work represents the input from Christians who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, as well as many others who, though not Christians, share a deep admiration for the man that Jesus was. We are deeply inspired and curious to explore his story. We look at the biography of Jesus through a modern lens to find new relevance in often overlooked moments and themes from his life. There's a lot um, in that about us that is not okay. Um, And so I I just wanted to address this right up front as your pastor and say, if you see that commercial and you see Christians talking about it, man, have a conversation with them. Um, have a conversation with them. It's important for us to love our neighbor. I wholeheartedly support that. I encourage you to do that. But part of loving your neighbor is not just washing their feet, but sharing the gospel with them. Um, and that's, that's what we need to be as a church. All right? And that's what we as leaders need to be telling you. It's not just about washing people's feet. It's about washing their hearts. And only Jesus can do that. And it's only through their laying down of their lives that they can do that. And that's what that commercial was missing. All right. So that was a little bit of a side kind of thing this morning. Um, as uh, you'll, you'll find this out as, as your pastor, as cultural things pop up like this, uh, I want to address them. 
I, I don't want to be a pastor that, that ignores them or, or floats over them or, or makes you wonder, what, I wonder what the pastor thinks about this. I want you to, <laughs> you to know what I think about it. Um, and uh, I'm not a fan of the He Gets Us movement. I think uh, they, uh, they are teaching a different gospel. Um, all right, so uh, I already kind of talked about how we are in the Lent, uh, Lent season, the season of Lent. And so we're, we're going to be going through and starting our Easter series this morning, and I'm excited about that. The Easter series is called Great Expectations. And so there's nine, uh, nine services, including a Good Friday service in here, um, that we're going to be looking at different aspects um, and different expectations of Jesus' ministry um, and his Messiahship. Um, that either the Jews had, the disciples have, or even that we have, um, and, and how that affects and, and can reflect our life as believers or non-believers. Um, and so this morning, we're going to be starting uh, with that first expectation, um, and that is the expectation of a mir- miracle working uh, Messiah. And so we're going to be looking at uh, the miracles of Jesus and how they point to his Messiahship and, and how they point to him being the Messiah and the, and the Son of God and, and what that means for us um, as, as humans um, and how, we can, how, we're supposed to, how we're supposed to respond, but how we often respond in light of um, he, him being the Messiah. Um, Acts 2, 22, when Peter, right after the uh, indwelling of the Holy Spirit for the disciples, Peter gets up and he preaches his famous sermon um, in Jerusalem. And in this sermon in Acts 22, uh, 22, he says, men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him. In your midst, as you know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Man, Acts 2.22, man, it says that God attested to us by with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through tr- Christ. And so the idea that Jesus did miracles the truth that Jesus did miracles was God's evidence to the world that Jesus was the son of God, that Jesus was the Messiah and that Jesus was fulfilling the plan that he had put into place for our salvation. <clears throat> so let's kind of look at what the miracles of Jesus were that we kind of saw or that you see throughout the Gospels. Uh, first, we see that Jesus had authority over natural forces. So in Matthew 8, later on in the chapter, um, Jesus had just gotten finished uh, preaching and teaching and healing. And he was tired, and so he was like, man, I'm going to go across the way. Let's get in the boat and go across the sea. And he gets in the boat, and he lays down to take a nap and expecting his disciples to go across. And then a big storm pops up, um, which is pretty common in uh, in the Sea of Galilee. And and, uh, uh, they get afraid. They get afraid. And so they go wake up Jesus and um, he rebukes the wind. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I can't go outside and rebuke the wind or like rebuke the cold. Uh, I, I don't have authority to do that. Uh, but Jesus stands up and he, and he first kind of chastises them. He, he says, man, <laughs> men of, of little faith, uh, you, if you believe that I'm the Messiah and, and the Christ, do you think a storm is going to overtake us? You don't think God is going to protect us in this moment? I mean, think about that. You think 
God would have done all of this just for Jesus to die in a little storm on a boat? No, don't think so. But it just kind of demonstrates where the disciples' hearts were in that moment. They weren't trusting in God and trusting that Christ was the Messiah. So he stands up and he rebukes the wind, and the wind calms down. And, and what, what's the response to that? The men marveled, saying, what sort of, sort of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? And so we see, this is, uh, we see multiple times through the gospel, but this is a great uh, illustration of how God, how Jesus has authority over the natural forces of this world. Next, we see he has, um, he has the authority to heal the sick. Matthew 4, 24, so his fame spread throughout all Syria. They brought him all the sick, those who were afflicted with various diseases and pains, those opposed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. The healing ministry of Jesus was a large part of his ministry. Many of the stories that we have and miracles that we see deal with the healings, the healing ministry of Jesus. <clears throat> One of the things that I read in, in a commentary that I think it's, it's a great, I, uh, great picture of, of Jesus' healing ministry is that Jesus' healing ministry um, was to bring about healing, but it was also to demonstrate and give us a picture of what it would look like when the world is redeemed. He was giving us a glimpse in the healing ministry of Jesus. He was giving us a glimpse of what it will look like to live in the new heaven and the new earth where all disease, all pain, all suffering will be wiped away. And so not only was he easing and comforting those who were in the moment right then providing a healing, his healing ministry provides us a picture of what it will look like in the future, in the future coming kingdom. He also casted out demons, and, and we see this multiple times through, through the gospel, his authority over uh, the demons. Mark 1, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. I love the story of Luke 8, 20, uh, Luke 8 26 and 33, through 33, where um, Jesus is... is uh, he meets a man from the city who had uh, demons, and for a long time he had worn no clothes. He hadn't lived. He was living in the tombs, and and when he sees Jesus, he falls down to him, and he says with a loud voice, "What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me." In other uh, other versions, it says, uh, or other accounts in the Gospels, the, the demon also asks, have you come to torture me before it was time? Before it was time. And Jesus tells him to be quiet. To not let, let them know, because even the demons knew who he was. He had authority over the demons. And he asks him what his name is, and this is the, and the demon a answers him, Legion. For many demons had entered him, and they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. So Christ commands them to depart, and they flee into a herd of pigs, and then the herd of pigs run off into, run off the side of a cliff and drown. I love this story because it perfectly demonstrates his authority over demons and how they know who he is. They know that they have no power or say. 
He can send them to the abyss right then if he wanted. And they're begging him for mercy. Have you ever thought about that? The demons begging Jesus for mercy. That was their response. But it's not our response sometimes. He also had authority over death. In raising the dead, Luke seven fourteen through 15, then he came up and touched the bier, and the bearers stood still, and he said, young man, I say to you, rise, and the dead man sat up <clears throat> and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. We have a couple of instances recorded through the gospel where Jesus raised people from the dead, showing his authority over death. And so his miracles demonstrate his authority over all things. All things fall under him. And we, we, hear, we see him tell us this in Matthew 28, 18. He famously says, says, Jesus came to him and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Well, what does that authority mean? That authority also means that he has the authority to grant eternal life. And he tells us to go make disciples, Right? of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In John 17, 1 and 2, it says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. So it is in this moment, in the moment of the crucifixion, right before that we see that God has already given him the authority. He has already had the authority to grant eternal life. And he is, he is coming to the Father and saying, this is the hour, this is the time. Glorify me as I have glorified you so that, my, so that people may be saved. And so the purpose of his miracles was to point to his authority that was one of the purposes. It's, it's to point to his authority, point to the need that we have, the brokenness in the world, and how he is the answer to all that is broken. And so what are we to do with this information? Well, we're, we're to trust Jesus. Where did, that's, that's the answer. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If Jesus has the authority that's demonstrated through his miracles, man, we're to trust Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. Because he is the way, he's the truth and the life. Let's look at some more purposes of Jesus and miracles together. Um, we kind of talked about this already, but it, the, um, one of the purposes of Christ's miracles was to bring healing and wholeness to the world. Luke 8, 35, this is right after that story of the demon, uh, the demon's legion being cast out from, from the man. Then people went out and saw what happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. The purpose of Jesus' miracles was to bring healing and wholeness to a broken world. It was to show that he is the only one that can bring healing and and wholeness. Many of us uh, are married in the room. If you're not married, you're going to find out that once you do get married, if, if God graces you uh, with a husband or a wife, you're going to find out that marriage is hard sometimes. And uh, that there's going to be moments that you need healing and wholeness. And, and there's a lot of really terrible advice for married people out there. <laughs> Can I get an amen on that? I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of terrible advice 
for, uh, for married people out there. A lot of worldly advice. Um, I, I saw a... Uh, um, I saw a podcast recently. I'm trying to remember the name of it. Uh, but it's two divorce lawyers. Um, and all they do is talk about all the ways uh, you should and how, how to divorce your, your spouse and why you should divorce your spouse. I mean, obviously, they're divorce lawyers, so they have financial gain in it. But they give some really terrible advice. They give a lot of advice on on you know, marriage is supposed to make you happy. Marriage is supposed to uh, bring you joy. Marriage is, you know, if you're not getting what you need out of the marriage, you should just leave. I mean, that's just all terrible advice, right? I think we'd all say that. But in reality, what, what the Bible says is that Christ, when you're confronted with, with problems in your marriage, if we run to Christ... He can bring healing and wholeness to, to marriages. And I, I've seen it. I've seen it happen. Marriages that are on the rocks because of, of affairs, infidelity, um, addiction, um, and, and really brokenness. And the answer is not, not divorce. The answer is not uh, um, abandoning uh, your spouse, but rather running to Christ, both of you. Because as, as you put Christ in the center of your life, if you, as you dig deeper into uh, getting to know Jesus more, he brings healing and wholeness, not just to you, but to your marriage. It's the same thing when when dealing with addiction. Um, those who may be in the room have dealt with addiction. Um, it's hard. It's a constant thing. I've heard, I've heard it said, and many uh, addicts will tell you this, that addiction never stops. You never stop being an addict. Um, you just, uh, you're constantly an addict, but, but you're just not actively participating in that. And I would say we're constantly active. We're always sinners, right? But we might not, we not be, not be being active in our sin that we struggle with. The only answer to the brokenness that we see in sin and addiction is Jesus Christ. That's the only answer. He's the only one that can bring true fulfillment and wholeness to our life. And if we can, well, you can go through the 12 steps and, and everything, but if you don't have Christ at the center of your life, there's no power behind that. The only power that we, we have is the power through Christ to overcome. And so one of the purposes of Jesus Christ's miracles was to bring healing and wholeness. It was also to reveal God's kingdom to the world. He says in Matthew 12, 28, but if it is by the spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Christ's message was that the kingdom of God was not coming, that it was here. It was present. We were to repent because the kingdom of God was at hand. And so his miracles served a purpose to tell the world, to show the world that the kingdom of God was here and is a present. And we have to make a decision. We have to choose in a way to respond. It was also to fulfill God's word. Matthew eight sixteen through 17. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons and he cast out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick. Uh, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. And that's from the passage Isaiah 53, 4, um, where Isaiah 53, 4 is talking about the coming Messiah. And so his miracles of, of healing and casting out demons, um, 
That was to fulfill a prophecy that had been given hundreds of years before Christ's birth in Isaiah 53, 4. You're welcome to go read that if you want. It was also to bring glory to God, John eleven four. 4. But when Jesus heard it, he said, the illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God and so that the Son of God may be glory, glorified through it. So this is, he's talking with <clears throat> some Pharisees here that are asking about a gentleman who had just been healed. And he said, and they were asking what sin in his family caused his illness. That's a common, um, common thought. Um, and uh, even today, there's many people, especially in the um, uh, 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 in, in certain circles in Christianity that believe that, that illnesses are caused by your sin um, or lack of faith. Um, and I would just point them to John eleven four 4 and say, the illness is for the glory of God. It's so that Jesus, so the Son of my man or Son of God may be glorified through it. Um, and so Jesus is saying, man, the reason we have illness in the world, the reason for this is, is so that God's mercy might be seen, God's grace might be seen, and that we might come to know our need for Christ, our need for God, so that God might be glorified. Then Acts 2, 22, we kind of already talked about this. It was to show that Jesus was the Messiah. Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you know yourself. He was the Messiah, attested to by God through his miracles. It leaves us no room when we're looking at the miracles of God and the purposes of the miracles of God. It leaves us no room when we're confronted with the fact that Christ was the Messiah. Gives us no excuse, and it leaves us no room to make an argument that we didn't know, or that the world didn't know. Romans 1.20 tells us that we are without excuse, because even the world, the creation around us, demonstrates us the power of, of God. And the wonders of God. His miracles demonstrate that he is the Messiah. That he is the one that saves. That we are in need of him. And that he is the only one that can bring about our salvation. And so we have responses. We have to respond to this truth. And so we see it in Scripture. There's several different responses to Jesus Christ's miracles. And I would say today, these are still the responses that we see in the world to Jesus, to the gospel, to Jesus' truth of, of him being the Messiah, him being our Savior. Um, these are the responses that we see. First, we see the response of terror and fear. And so Mark 4, 41, we're talking about, um, again, the, the miracle where he is uh, calming the sea. And they, it says, and they were filled with great fear, said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and sea obey him? And so we see that a response, and this is oftentimes throughout Scripture, when we're confronted with the power and majesty of God, is terror and fear. It is one of the reasons why when you hear stories about people being visited by angels or going to heaven um, and coming back, why I personally am, am skeptical about that. is because if you look in Scripture, in every time that a person is confronted with the glory and power of God either visited by an angel or in Jesus' miracles, 
it induces terror and fear. If you go and look at every single time an angel visits somebody, the first response is them to fall on the ground and, and some of them say, don't kill me. And so when I hear stories of like, yes, an angel visited me and, and told me all these truths that I need to go and tell the world, I'm like, that doesn't sound like any angel visit I've ever heard of. And that's, that's what we mean by put it against Scripture. Man, what's the historical evidence that how humans have reacted when confronted with the glory and majesty of God? And that's terror and fear. And so that's, that's a, I would say, a, kind of a right response. We should have a little bit of fear, maybe a lot of bit of fear. The other one is wonder and amazement. Another response in uh, Luke four thirty six, and they were all amazed, saying, uh, said, and said to one one another, "What is this word? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out." This was right after he was teaching in Capernaum when a man was possessed by a spirit passed by, and he and he tells the spirit to come out, and they were wonder, they were in in wonder and amazement. Who is this man who has this authority? And I would say that's definitely another response that I would say is, is one that we should all have. Wonder and amazement. The other one is faith and gratitude. Luke 19, 37, as he was drawing near on, on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. Man, we should be doing this every Sunday. We should be doing this every day that we live. We should be rejoicing in the mighty works that we have seen in the mighty works of your salvation. Amen. That should be enough for you to be celebrating and rejoicing and praising the Lord every day in the fact that he took you out of death and brought you into life. That right there, that miracle is enough to give glory to God forever and ever. And yet we see over and over and over and over again an immense amount of blessing that is poured out on the world and our lives and ourselves. We see miracles coming uh, even today. And so a right response for us is faith and gratitude. And so, yes, there is fear, fear of the Lord, and that is healthy. But there's also wonder and amazement and faith and gratitude. We are to be amazed that the Lord has mercy on us, that loves us, that cares for us, that wants a relationship with us, and we are to respond with faith and gratitude to that. That's the appropriate response when confronted with the truth of Jesus being the Messiah as evidenced by his miracles. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to not be a part of this, but meet someone who had experienced a, a miracle that was a miracle from God. Just, um, and, and anyone, I would, I would say anyone who heard that story cannot walk away and say that God didn't have something to do with that. And we, maybe you have a story yourself of, of a miracle that you've experienced or you've, you've seen or heard, but this one was, um, a pastor friend of mine was, um, he had a family going to his church and their daughter was, uh, was ill, uh, gravely ill, had slipped into a coma, had lost all, basically all brain function. The, the doctors had basically declared her brain dead. Um, and so she was on life support and, um, they said, you should, you know, 
talk about taking her off life support. Like, there's nothing we can do. She's not here anymore. Um, her body might, her heart might be beating, but she's not here anymore. Um, and uh, they were in the, in the discussion of that, um, and he went to visit them at the hospital, and and so they kind of gathered around her bed, um, all holding hands, and and uh, each one of them, two two of them were holding her hands, um, and just praying, Lord, in your providence, heal her, if that's if that's your will, we ask you to heal her, um, and this by all the doctors, all the nurses had said she was gone. She was dead, brain dead. And in the midst of that prayer, in the midst of that prayer, she opened up her eyes and grasped their hands and started talking to them. Like six hours later, she was sitting up in a chair having a normal conversation with everybody in the room. That's a miracle of God. It's the power of prayer, and it's a miracle of God. All the doctors, all the nurses were like, we have no idea. There is no medical explanation for this. The only response in that moment in seeing a miracle like this place is faith and gratitude toward God. When confronted with the truth of his authority over death, his authority over illness, his authority over natural forces. The only response that we have should be wonder and amazement, faith and gratitude, and trusting in him. However, unfortunately, that's not the only response that we see. The expectation of the Jewish leaders were not being met by Christ in his miraculous ministry. But rather, they began to become jealous of him in this ministry. And so we see that in John eleven forty seven 47 through 53, it says, so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, what are we to do for this man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. But one, uh, one of them, Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all, nor do you understand that it is better for you that one man should die for the people, not that the whole nation should perish. He did not say this on his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but also to gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. And so, unfortunately, the world when confronted with the truth of, of, of Jesus being the Messiah. Well, I think there's only one response that we should have. The other response is opposition and hatred. So the world, and, and this, is, this is the idea here, we are in a spiritual war. We are in a spiritual war. The world is opposed to our message. The world is opposed to Jesus. The world is opposed to the truth of the gospel. And so even in the face of being confronted with the miraculous signs that attest that he is the Messiah, the world responds in opposition and hatred. And Jesus responds, he says, if in 1524, he tells them, if I had done nothing, if I had done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now that they have seen and hated both me and my father, they are guilty of that sin. And the world is guilty 
of that sin. And that's why it's so important that we know what the message of the gospel is. The, the truth of the gospel. It's also so important for us to communicate the message of the gospel clearly. It's because the world is in opposition to that message. Because the world is being influenced by Satan and his demons who want to see people deceived fall away from following Christ. That's the reality that we're faced with. As a church, we're given the mission to tell people the gospel. And we have the evidence to back it up. We have the evidence that Christ was the Messiah because of his miracles. And the miracles we continue to see today that are done through him. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, and I would point this as a direct conflict to what we talked about at the very beginning about the he gets us thing. In his, in his book, Mere Christianity, if you've never read it, I would highly suggest it to you. In his book, Mere Christianity, he says, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a moral te- great moral teacher, but I do not accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool or you can fall at his feet and claim him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him, his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. And I would say that his miracles have n- attest to that truth that he has not left that door open to us. You can call him crazy or you can call him Lord. You can be in opposition of him or you can respond in faith and gratitude to him. There is no other way. You only have two choices. Either accept him or you don't. And that's the fact of the world. So if you're sitting here today and you have not accepted Christ, man, I hope that you see that that Christ's miracles attest to his sovereignty, that that he was God, he is God, and the truth that he died on the cross for our salvation because we need it, and that he was raised three days later and is alive and ruling by the, on the right hand of the Father, man, you need to believe that. You need to repent and believe. And for us, us as believers, this is a good reminder that we serve a powerful God that does miracles, not just then, but is actively doing miracles today through saving people and raising people from the dead into life. And we need, we need to remember that. We, re, we need to remember that as we go out and we tell people the gospel, that we have that authority that he has given to us. And we need to share the gospel with people. Let's pray.